So our next guest here on the telethon is a pre-recorded interview, having some fun with uh, with Ryan. Ryan Levingston is on, and he's uh, always out in the world doing things that are fascinating to me. Look, always like a lot of fun in awesome locations where there's sun and water and beach. And we welcome him now. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for thanks for being part of the telethon. Hey, Tim. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I. You know, I really am always in awe of your locations, what I see on Facebook or following your YouTube channel and what you what you guys do out there. You and Nicole, right, are out on the open water, yeah. and it looks like a lot of fun, but yet a lot of work. Um, so it always yeah. leads me to my first question, because sometimes I do wonder, like, where's Ryan right now? Like, I wonder what he's, like, where is he <laughs> in the world? You know, because you're... You're not tied down outside of just your boat and where you guys go from from place to place. So, where are you right now as we record this? Well, this is it's interesting. We're actually right now located in a small atoll in the Tuamotus, which is a chain of of atolls in between the Marquesas Islands and Tahiti. So, we're about a two day sail uh, east northeast from Tahiti right now. But what's interesting is when we came here for the first time about five years ago. Uh, you know, they barely, they had electricity, but only in the town and, uh, you know, certainly no internet, no cell phone, anything like that. And now we're sitting in this little deserted anchorage in the corner of the atoll. And, you know, there's just one little sort of hut with somebody living in it. <laughs> and, um, and yet they have 4G internet now that, <laughs> you know, they laid a fiber optic cable and put a big, big antenna in the middle of the town and bang. Now it's, um, I can, I can talk to you from pretty much the middle of nowhere. It's a, it's a, very surreal contrast for us, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine that technology finds its way there in this little uh, tiny dot in the planet. Um, it finds its way, you're right, middle of nowhere. But sometimes the middle of nowhere yeah. can be really peaceful. Have you kind of come to find that over the years that you've been out at sea, living on the boat, being, uh, or I should say, having this lifestyle? Yeah, no, there's moments of peaceful, mm -hmm. but to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of the opposite. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, we're, we look forward to usually one week a year or so, or a couple of weeks a year, we get to go back to the United States and just fly in a house and know that the wind isn't going to change and push the boat <laughs> into a reef or that the anchor line won't part or that the, the, all the electrical and safety systems will continue to work. So we don't lose, you know, refrigeration or the ability to make water or, uh, you know, the ability to navigate, we know the sails aren't going to tear. So when, when you're out here, there's, there's so many things that can go bad quickly. And there's so few resources to fix them once they do go bad. So you spend a, a tremendous amount of, of mental energy, not worrying, but maintaining vigilance, let's say. So you, you, after a while, you know, we've sort of found this kind of balance between, uh, you know, neuroticism and, uh, and appreciation, I guess, you know, <laughs> uh, out here in paradise. So, you know, for example, we have alarms that go off, you know, in your house, you have a smoke alarm. And if the smoke alarm goes off, you wake up and you make sure there's no fire. And if, if there is, you call 911 and you get outside, right? Well, for us, you know, we have the smoke alarms and if the smoke alarm goes off and there's smoke, we are 911, you know, and if it doesn't work, <laughs> we have to call like, via satellite to somebody to hopefully get us in a week or so and bring supplies to shore and all the rest. And, you know, so, but not only do we have a smoke alarm, we have an alarm for if the boat, if the anchor doesn't hold and the boat starts to move, you know, towards the reef, we have an alarm if the wind suddenly changes dramatically, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of things to, to pay attention to. And, um, while it's, it's not necessarily relaxing, like you'd see on a brochure for a vacation to Tahiti, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's certainly worth it and it's certainly rewarding and it, and it, it's, it's more adventure than vacation is, mm. is probably the way I'd put it. Yeah. That's, I think that's a great description. I mean, for someone like myself, who's usually pretty much, you know, kind of stays within the United States here in my little corner of Wisconsin in the North. And we do look, I think, and I'm speaking collectively of those that are up here in the mm -hmm. North. Uh, you know, we, we kind of look at maybe pictures you take or things you post and maybe this, oh man, that looks beautiful. I wish I could do that or be there. Um, but I think we immediately associate it with what you said, a vacation, something that you're not really working yeah. on. Someone else is doing the work, but you're it. I mean, you guys right. are the work. You're the backup plan. You are a survival adventurist is basically what it comes down to. 
Yeah, but you know, it's not uncomfortable. Like we have mm-hmm. a nice boat. We have when things go well, we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when things don't go well, it it becomes uncomfortable very quickly. You know, <laughs> because I, I remember last year, for example, we we ran out of butane. We have little bottles of butane to cook with. You know, we ran out, and um, and we you know we had we still had some food, and we and for some reason our our freezer had failed, and we had to. Uh, cook the food to put it, you know, in the refrigerator. Otherwise we were going to lose a a lot of like, you know, protein. And we didn't, we weren't able, there was no resupply ship coming to the atoll for a couple of weeks. And, you know, this was an issue. So we went to shore and we made a fire and, you know, took our barbecue grill and, and just cooked all the food over the fire. and brought. So it's little things like that, which are fun and they're adventurous. And, you know, in retrospect, they're, they're kind of neat that they happen, but but you're right. And it, it, we are doing everything from maintaining the boat to monitoring the weather to figuring out how to get new supplies to making sure the electrical systems run, making, you know, when we want to put fuel in the boat, oftentimes we have to go ashore with these, you know, sort of jugs that hold about 20 liters, about five gallons each. Uh, is that right? Whatever, 20 liters. <laughs> you know, we fill it up with diesel and then we take it back and, and these, you know, we take it back and forth in these little inflatable boats that are kind of wobbly and then we have to carry it up into the boat and pour it into the tank and then go back ashore and fill them up again and you know over and over again so so even the easiest thing like going grocery shopping uh you know we haven't provisioned in about four weeks for example so we're running low on food and uh this week the supply ship comes actually uh on wednesday Hmm. which is why um i needed to talk to you quickly because we (laughs) have to move the boat to a place that can access the supply ship and they don't have any internet. So, you know, we were able to get message out using satellite and, and a long distance high frequency radio that we would like to reserve um, some eggs, please, from, you know, the, the egg guy. Yeah. You know, and we're, we're basically making like a, a day long or a couple day long trip to get to this anchorage. We had to make sure the weather would be okay to be in that anchorage and that, you know, uh, with COVID, there's, there's some, mm. uh, you know, complications with getting, getting to the supply ship and, Anyways, it's turning into like a, a couple day process with communication via satellite email and uh, long distance um, phone and all this other stuff to be able to go to the grocery store. That's so, wild. Um, but 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 uh, I think people like like us who it, it's part of our daily life anywhere, even in the United States. Like we were talking earlier, you and I off off air about what does snow bring to issues of accessibility and moving around town and so forth. And it's not that much different from what I'm doing. You know, for me, it's, it's sand instead of snow, but you know, you still have to sort of uh, stay, you know, kind of almost like dance with the environment to, mm. to be able to get to where you want to go. And uh, you know, we're just our, our accessible tools instead of a wheelchair, I have a boat, you know, and uh, or, you know, for kiteboarding, I have a harness and a kite that hold me up and uh but but really, other than that, the only difference is the environment we're doing it in, and maybe the types of challenges we face. But the the skills that that we learn as being people with disabilities, getting through the world, and and the skills that frankly groups like the FSH Society um, help us to to have access to the resources to to really develop uh, you know sort of an, an acute awareness of of um, mobility and things that we can and, and let's say adaptability and uh, an enhanced ability to adapt uh that that's all applicable out here if, if i hadn't have gone through fsh and and sort of had access to the resources that i've had and, and so forth i'm not sure that i would have had as much success uh, out here mm-hmm. doing these things so we're more connected than you think buddy <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be a little more tan but but we're coming from oh. we're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> a lot more tan. Let's say that. Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm like virtually clear. So it's, yeah. It's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe a lot more tan. <laughs> <laughs> so that that always, I think, is probably a question you get asked, and, and I'll ask it again. I'm sure I know we talked about it before, but you know, having FSHD and, and having to choose or you chose the lifestyle that you have, right? Being on the boat, being an adventurer. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of struggles does FSHD give you or challenges maybe is a better word? Yeah. Uh, sometimes they're struggles for sure. I'm not going to candy coat it, uh, especially in the last, uh, especially the last year. Uh, I think the m- common mistake that, that uh, people, especially in our community have that, that don't know me personally is they think that I am 
you know, very far on the able-bodied side of the continuum. And, and in actuality, I'm sort of more in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we did talk about it, but I, I know there's a lot of people, but just, just, I'm sure some people would want to know, but like I, where I am right now, I, you know, I can't stand on my toes. I can't lift my arms up over about, you know, chest high, mm-hmm. uh, certainly can't lift anything. When I'm on the ground, it's sort of a five-step process to get back up again. I can't, you know, spring up. Um, if I fall against the wall, and put my arms out, um, I'm still face planting into the wall. I can't brace myself. Uh, you know, I can't lift my legs up. That's a new one. I can't mm. sort of lift my legs up. So my knee is horizontal very easily. I can kind of throw it up there, but I can't, um, hold it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, all, all the usual stuff with shoulders rolling forward and, you know, appearance wise, we're in bikini, you know, bathing suits all the time out here. So I'm always, you know, stomach way out, back curved, butt out, you know, the usual presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, walking, running is just not even an option at all. Walking has become much more difficult, um, especially over the last year. And while I'm able to do it and I'm grateful for that, uh, it, it's in, it's in spurt and I have to sort of train regularly to maintain that ability. So for me on a boat, the good news about a boat is that there's lots of things to hold on to you know, and where there isn't one, we can put it, it's our boat. So we just install handrails and, and, um, I sort of go up and down. There's all the staircases are like two to three steps long and they're usually in a little corridor, okay. like a narrow thing. So I can kind of brace myself against one side, uh, and use friction to hold me up when I go up and down. Hmm. Uh, but, but without doubt, uh, I think a lot of us experience when we're under stress and when we're, um, you know, fatigued from lack of sleep or from lots of physical activity, that's when our symptoms sort of oftentimes are the strongest or the most pronounced. And the same is true for me. And and that happens primarily when I'm on passage underway. So, you know, we do these two or three or sometimes, you know, longer passages, day passages where, um, you're, you and, 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 and your partner, if you only have two people on the boat, someone has to always be awake. So you sleep usually three hours at a time and then you're awake for three hours and you sleep for three hours and you're awake for three hours. And as sort of captain of this boat and the one who's, who has the higher sort of responsibility to keep all the systems running, sort of the engineer of the boat, um, I'm, I'm never really off duty. So hmm. even when I'm sleeping, it's with one eye open and I'm, I'm always trying to make sure that conditions aren't changing in a way that, that would exceed Nicole's comfort or, or ability or my own. Um, so I have to constantly download the latest weather charts and then interpret them and then make navigation decisions and make sure the no systems on the boat are, are getting close to failure, you know, mm-hmm. try to catch it before it happens. Right. And then, and then implement all of those things, changing this, making not just the sort of the way the sails are set up, but which sails we're even using and, um, you know, which course are we going to go? How are the waves going to affect the movement of the boat all while sleeping, you know, three to six or so hours a day in broken up segments. And in the meantime, the boat is constantly moving. So you're physically fatigued, just trying to maintain balance is challenging. Uh, and you have to still do stuff like eat and use the bathroom and <laughs> all that. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're, they're exceptionally exhausting to the point where almost, you know, like, the passages themselves are no longer for me like like pleasurable if that's a good way to put it they are they are without a doubt uh pain and suffering for me um but that doesn't make them not worthwhile uh you know i think i think a lot of times people think that the only things in life that are worth pursuing are things that are fun or feel good or whatever and, and i don't think that's true uh because the, the fact that these passages are so challenging and require so much, uh, they, they, they very much make me aware of, of the limitations to my mobility that mm. FSH is bringing, um, that when I complete the passage, I'm sort of hardened. I'm reinforced. I, I'm like, okay, I've done that. Well, I can certainly now, you know, get down the beach and, and pick up a coconut. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, it, it gives you some perspective. Um, And a lot of people go through challenges and hardships and then afterwards are like, okay, day to day ain't so bad compared to that. Uh, this is just sort of the one that I go through in in particular. And, and, and frankly, the, uh, the sort of, you know, reward at the end is, is, is often worth it. You know, places like where we are now, Fakarava, 
you know, it's, it's beautiful. It is paradise. And when the anchor's set and the winds are calm and you have food in the fridge and the systems are running and, and all the rest, and you've got some sleep, you, you wake up and, and you're looking out at paradise. So, mm. and you got there on your own. Uh, right. and that's, and that's, uh, that's an experience that is, is worth doing. And you don't have to have a boat to do it. I think a lot of us, um, assume that because we have this disability that therefore you know, sort of wilderness experiences or challenging physical experiences are, are out of limits. And it's just not the case, especially with um, the support of, of some of the forums and, and the ability of the FSH society to connect people together. Uh, you know, I used to do triathlons and I think that that's a great place for people to start is through sport. Mm -hmm. There are so many accessible sports now, even, even kiting and, and surfing and stuff where you might not think how the heck can I possibly do that? I can't even walk. I use a power chair. I can barely hold my head up. You'd be surprised. Back when I was still fairly able-bodied, I worked at uh, at an aquatic center. We taught kayaking and sailing, and all these other things. And I remember it was one of my first experiences with somebody who had a very far progressed case of of FSHD. And my job was to take them kayaking. So I actually went to San Diego State University and talked to the engineering department, and we built a little pivoting sort of paddle support that uh, sat on a kayak in front of in front of this guy. And then we built these gloves with Velcro on them that let that held his hand to the paddle. And just by kind of wiggling his shoulders, basically back and forth and, and rocking a little bit, he had a chair with a Velcro um, sort of strap to hold him up. And then I sat in the back seat to maintain the boat's balance, you know? Yeah. And just with that, he was able to propel the kayak under his own power. And, wow. and we went, you know, we went, I don't know if he's going to do it in, you know, whitewater rapids or strong <laughs> winds or something, but but um, but maybe, but, but regardless for him at the time, that was uh, an exceptional adventure. And, and what I'm doing right now sounds like an exceptional adventure to a lot of people, but to somebody who sails maybe by themselves around the world nonstop or something like that, what I'm doing sounds like a weekend trip down the street, you know, so <laughs> it's all relative, uh, you know, and if we compare ourselves to our current where we are now and say, okay. I want to do something more adventurous. What's a little bit more adventurous or a little bit more challenging than what I'm doing now, whether it's physically or mentally or requiring, you know, both then, uh, and then we do it a little bit. There's a, re there's something to that. There's something about that that is deeply fulfilling. Um, it, it, it's a sense of satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment, certainly a great sense of freedom. And I think it's worth doing. I've just taken it a little bit sort of, you know, I started, I started with that and built on it, built on it, built on it. And here I am. Uh, so if anybody is looking at what I'm doing and wants to do it, or if they're just looking at their own life and wants mm -hmm. to, to make a change, start with, just make a change, <laughs> start yeah. with something simple and the SSA society, contact them and they'll put you in touch with me. They've done that many, many times, uh, you know, over the years, if, if I'm someone you want to talk to yeah. and, and I'm happy to share my perspectives on it, or they'll put you in touch with somebody who probably, you know, might have information even better. Uh, you know, better suited for, for whoever it is that's contacting them. So that's a long answer uh, to your question about <laughs> how do I get by day to day, but, but, but I think that, yeah. that it's a necessary answer. Absolutely. Um, within that answer. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I had, you know, questions I had written out and I'm like, I'm checking them off. I mean, he's answering them right here. And I, and I'm glad you answered <laughs> it that way because you're right. There is probably a little bit of a negative pushback. Well, you know, he's more able than us. That's why he can do this or this or that. Yeah, that that probably some people think, wow, Ryan, you know, can do this stuff because he's not as as disabled as I am or he has more mobility or whatever it may be. And they kind of take those things that you're doing and kind of put a slight negative tone to it. And yeah, for sure. And I think and the way you described it there is the push back to say, no, you can do something, uh, change your life. It's just different than what I did. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, what it, it used to bother me, honestly, like in the early days, especially when I was doing triathlon and, and all that, and I had some success in, in adaptive sports and then later sailing. Uh, and, and then people, and I was doing it, you know, doing it for me, obviously, but I, the way I was doing it was for us. Like I was very public about it and I made a big effort to make sure that I reached out specifically to the FSH community, but to people with disabilities in general. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I put a lot of work into that. And, and the reason was is because when I was diagnosed back in the dark days, but the internet was brand new then. And, 
And I remember, you know, all we had was clinical stuff where doctors were saying, you, uh, you know, just basically quit all activity and rest all the time or you're going to destroy yourself. And I was like, well, I'm going to test that hypothesis because I'm an active guy already and I'm going to continue doing it and see what happens and put myself out there hoping that the information will either confirm what the doctors say and everybody Mm -hmm. will have this cautionary tale or it will show that there's another approach to living with this disease. And ultimately, that's what happened. And, um, you know, the FSH Society was was involved in the very early stages of that and and, um, helped me spread my message and, and share my example. And, that, and then through that, there's a, a lot of people who sort of had a lot of success in sports. And now, of course, the, the, the recommendations have changed. And it's not because of me, but I think that I was an early example of that they could point to and say, okay, these new recommendations, um, here, here's an example of them in effect. And so it bothered me when people would say, oh, you're, you can just do these things because you're more able-bodied. There's no way I could do it and all the rest. And over time, I sort of have learned that, you know, that's, that's not just a disabled thing. Able-bodied people often look at what other people are doing and compare themselves. And then um, you have a choice. You know, you either say, hey, I, something about that resonates with me and I want to put a little bit of that in my life or, and, and where do I start? And, you know, you sort of break it down and you set goals and you start achieving them and little ones and they become bigger ones over time. Or you can look at it and say, oh, I could never do that. And, you know, screw that guy and who, you know, whatever, or that girl. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then just give up and just be bitter and miserable. And, you know, frankly, I, I, I don't, you know, those, those people have made their choice. And if that's what they want to do, then, you know, that's their prerogative. But I, I suspect that most of the people listening to this podcast uh, <laughs> are either in the I want to do it category or they're in the um, maybe a little bit bitter because that's the only way that they've known. That's sort of their habit, but they don't want to be anymore. Yes. And One way to do that is to start looking at things that you can do that seem impossible or seem challenging and and break it down. Ask for help. Talk to people who are doing things and they'll give you, almost always they're glad to give you pointers. FSH Society is a fantastic resource for that. And one of the reasons, in my opinion, why they're so worth supporting. Uh, It's not just about research and about, um, you know, helping us find wheelchairs or whatever it is. You know what I mean? it's also about connecting us with each other and maintaining the sense of community and advocating for FSH and helping people understand what FSH is, which then down the line can lead to even able-bodied people going, you know what, this might work great for somebody who has, uh, you know, sort of a standard presentation of FSH, uh, you know, in, in terms of physical. And, and uh, you know, and, and, and so here we are. And uh, I think, you know, today's the first day of the rest of your life, right? <laughs> you know, right. That, that whole thing. Right. Uh, it's true. It's one hundred percent true. Before we let you go back into the uh, back into the seas, I guess, right <laughs> back into your routine of your day. Uh, where can people find more about you and the two afloat, and a little bit more about what you and Nicole are doing out there? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, anyone can contact me through any of these ways. Uh, Instagram. I'm at salty ryan the number one. Um, so at salty Ryan, the number one on Facebook, uh, Ryan Levinson, just my name, Facebook slash Ryan Levinson, um, on YouTube to afloat the word T W O and then A F L O A T. Uh, we answer comments. We answer DM, uh, through the FSH society. If somebody wants to contact me, they can contact, um, you or June or whatever, and get my direct contact info uh, that way as well. If they prefer email. I'm not always able to reply right now. We're about to head off into an area where we won't have internet probably for months at a time. Uh, so please, please bear with me, <laughs> but they can, if, if you Google me, there's tons of interviews from the past. And um, you mentioned earlier, North kiteboarding is mm-hmm. the, and North sales. They make uh, sales for boats and they make kiteboarding gear for kiteboarding. And I'm an ambassador for both of them. Uh, those are two sports that are, very, very uh, accessible to a wide range of physical abilities. And uh, and those two companies have been incredibly supportive in, in helping me um, maintain the ability to do my, you know, to, to basically they're, they're my passion, you know, yeah. is, is kiting and sailing. So you can find them, some interviews, some very recent interviews with me on those, on those, uh, those pages as well. Thanks, Ryan, for joining us. Uh, wish you the best. Be safe. Um, you and Nicole, we wish you guys the best. And uh, thanks for joining us today.
Tim, you're a legend. Thanks for uh, letting me ramble a little bit longer than our initially allotted time. And uh, I hope that something was helpful to anybody. And I'm very grateful to you and the FSH Society for helping make all of this possible for me and, and for the rest of us. And, and I sincerely mean that. Uh, Maruru Roa, Tahitian for thank you. <laughs>